Okay, good morning everyone and welcome. Let's take a moment to pray and we'll start. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come together around your word and uh, come together to learn, to be equipped. We ask, Lord, for the work of your spirit uh, to fill us with wisdom, with understanding and equipping so we be able to serve you well and speak into the hearts and lives of people. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So today uh, we get into our uh, main lesson, or I'd say the first of the main lessons, uh, lesson number two, where we talk about we want to talk about the existence of God, right? So lesson one was more of an introduction, was kind of giving us a framework saying, this is how we are going to approach this topic and also from a, a biblical perspective, understand the spiritual side of things, right? So now we start getting into various topics. Lesson number two, we want to talk about the existence of God, right? So, um, how do we know that God exists? Right? Or how can we tell people? I mean, people ask us questions. How do we respond? Right? Uh, and uh, we can look at it from a theological perspective. That means, uh, here are the scriptures. This is what the Bible says. We can look at it from a philosophical perspective. Philosophical means, just think about life in general, what you observe, and so on. We can also look at it from a scientific perspective. That means we look at uh, what is there in creation and we ask questions, right? So uh, we will do all three. That means we will look at it from a theological perspective, from Bible, what the Bible says about God and about creation. And we will look at it from a philosophical perspective, asking some general questions. And then uh, also from a scientific perspective. Now, uh, the reality is we will, we will meet different kinds of people. Not everybody is the same. You know, for some people, if we tell them what the Bible says, okay, they will accept. But some people are not, that they, they may not. They, they, they want maybe, I would say most people at least want some sort of a philosophical, you know, when they talk to us, they will ask general questions, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, this is what life is about, and how do you know there is a God? So many people will be in that category. And then, <clears throat> sorry, and then there are others who are in the scientific community. They want to, you know, they'll look at a little bit of science, and uh, whether it's, you know, biological or they look at uh, uh, the, the, the creation around uh, the astronomy or uh, the cosmos. Or they may, uh, you know, look at things from scientific perspective, and we need to answer, respond to that as well. So we look at all three, and of course, when we get into the scientific perspective, uh, it may be a little difficult for us. So okay, how do you do this? But it's okay. Just know that there is information available, and um, that information is also changing, you know, because a lot of dis new discoveries are being made, uh, and so on. There will be some people who may are interested in archaeological evidence, meaning there's so much in the Bible. Historically, is it, was it there or not? Or are, are they just stories? So when we show, hey, look at archaeologically, things in the Bible were actually there. Or oh, for some people, that is convincing. Right? So there are different kinds of people. You know, it's not like everybody, we have the same approach. We have to uh, be able to respond differently to different kinds of people, right? So let's begin. Uh, let's look at uh, a theo from a theological perspective, a few uh, scriptures, and then we will get into the, uh, the philosophical argument uh, and so on. So from a biblical perspective, in Isaiah 40 and verse 28, when the Bible talks to us about God, it also reveals to us certain aspects of God's uh, attributes. It says in Isaiah 40, verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, 
the law, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So you just look at that verse. Right? It tells us a lot about God. First of all, he, God is eternal. Yeah. Nobody created him. So some will say, if you say everything was created, who created God? What a question to ask. <laughs> because God is eternal. Nobody created him. He didn't have a beginning. Okay. So from eternity to eternity. Right? So God is eternal. So again, that's something uh, might be difficult for our minds to grasp. But then in our minds, we need to understand there is a realm of time and there's a realm outside of time. And God dwells outside of time. Right? In time, there is start and finish. But outside of time, it's, there's nothing like that. So God dwells in a realm outside of time. God is eternal. It says the everlasting God, the eternal God. is dwelling outside of time. He self-existed. He didn't have a beginning. He's, he's the one who gave beginning to other things, created other things, but he is eternal. So, so people ask that question, and then we say response. God, by nature, by definition, doesn't have a beginning. He was not created. If something was created, then the one who created that or whatever caused that is greater. Right? So God, by definition, when we say God, we're talking about a being who is eternal, self-existent, never had a beginning. Right? So he's eternal, the everlasting God. He's a creator of the ends of the earth. We'll come to that. But he never faints. His understanding is unsearchable. That means his energy or power doesn't diminish. Doesn't go down. That means his power or strength, he's omnipotent. He's always all powerful. It's not like someday he has more power, someday he's less power. No. He's always all powerful. Always all power. That's again an attribute of God. If that was not true, he cannot be God. If he's you know losing energy or losing his strength. And his understanding is until that means he is always omniscient. He is always all-knowing. Right. So, God is infinite in time, infinite in power, infinite in understanding. By definition. So, we're looking at it from a biblical perspective, but this gives us an understanding. This is, when we say God, we are talking about such a being, right, who is infinite in time, infinite in power, infinite in his intelligence, in his wisdom, in his understanding. That's by definition. Okay? Now, uh, in general, there are two kinds of people. There, are, there, are, there is the atheist, there is the agnostic. So, well, what is the atheist? The atheist is very firm or very conclusive in their position. They say there is no God. That's an atheist. The agnostic is in the middle. Their position is I don't know. If there is a God, I don't know. So I'm not saying there is no God. Neither am I saying there is a God. I'm just saying I don't know. Agnostic, right? You can't prove either way. So it's, uh, they're, they're not, you know, yeah, they're like, I don't know if there's a God. Right? So you'll have two kinds of people. Right? The atheist says there is no God. Everything happened and they tried to give an explanation, various kinds of explanations to how life came into existence. The agnostic is, I, it's not possible to know. So I'm not, decide I'm not that, I don't know. Right. So how do we uh, handle, you know, how do we respond to this? And, uh, you know, for us uh, as, as believers, it's, as, uh, our, our approach is, hey, God is big enough to handle our questions. God is not afraid of our questions. It's okay. Ask questions. Let's let's do our best from our side to answer it. So uh, when we talk about uh, when we are responding to atheism, and we will you know we'll present simple uh, uh, points or uh, 
I, I, I don't want to say arguments. Our goal is not to argue, but points that we can put forward to an atheist or to an agnostic. So from an atheist to an atheist, a simple thing is, see, if an atheist says there is no God, that's a very conclusive statement. And, and he says, there is no God, but I can give you, you know, uh, uh, explanations on how life came in, so on, based on reasoning. That's where we have to ask this question. How do you know there is no God? Just like how they ask us, how do you know there is a God? We ask, how do you know there is no God? Like, just as you say to us, we can't prove that there is a God. Neither can you prove there is no God. Same thing. Same logic applies to both sides. <laughs> so you can't just tell, the atheists can't just tell us, oh, you can't prove there is a God. Well, you can't prove there is no God. Because, like we said you know, in the last week, simple thing. To prove that there is no God, you must have done a thorough search of everything, gone everywhere, seen the whole universe and beyond, we don't know. Done a thorough search, then you can say, I searched everywhere, there was no God. But without doing that, if you jump to a conclusion saying there is no God, that is not a right conclusion. Right? So, simple, simple question. Right. So both of us are in the same kind of in the same place where now let us look at things logically, what we can see. Right? Because neither the atheist nor the creationist, the person who believes in God, creator, has the capacity to search out everything. Right? Yeah. We don't have the capacity. We are finite. We are finite. God is infinite. So it's like the finite mind trying to understand infinite God. It's not going to be possible. So within the capacity of what we have, let us look at things and see what, what, what seems very logical. Right? To the agnostic, so the agnostic is basically saying, Oh, you cannot know for sure. Well, if if but if you say you cannot know for sure, then that that statement itself is questionable. Okay? Even that statement is not final. So, which means, let's search. Right. So, don't stop by saying I don't know. Well, search. Right. Don't that that statement itself. This should not be a final answer. Let's search. Let's explore truths and see if you can arrive at some something that convinces you that uh, truth exists and God exists. So let's just look at it from a theological response first, and then we will get into a philosophical response. We'll, we'll, we'll try to see how much we can cover today, continue next week. So from a biblical perspective, what are the things we know about God? So as we introduced, we said God is an infinite being who always existed. That's, that's the quality or nature of God, right? Uh, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That means God is eternal. He's always uh, self-existent. Um, uh, he's self-existent. He always was. God is infinite. In his understanding, so as we, I'm just give, giving you additional scriptures here. You know, uh, his understanding is infinite, and his power is infinite. Right? There is no end to his might or his power. He never runs out of power. So, God is infinite in time, in power or strength, and infinite in understanding. And he self existent Second thing the Bible says is that God created the universe. Right? So this infinite God brought 
everything into existence. And we have scriptures for that, we know. Um, and we understand, we recognize that the universe is so big, so big. Uh, and once we get into the scientific side of things, we'll see. You know, uh, we are measuring the universe like in terms of 14 billion light years or something, uh, 14 billion years. It's so big, it's taken so much time uh, in our understanding for it to come into existence and so on. It's so vast. So the mind says, how could something so big, which has millions and maybe millions and millions of stars and things that we don't know out there, how could all this come into existence? And the Bible is saying, God creates it everything and an infinite god who is infinite in power infinite in understanding brought all this into existence for us those of us who believe in god and creation for us that's very logical yeah god is infinite so he created something that's like him that is so big right he didn't just create one earth one sun one moon something small that we can, yeah, yeah, that's all there is. No. He's so infinite. So it's reflecting who he is. He is infinite. Uh, everything is so complex. It's reflecting who he is. He's so wise. Right? Um, and so creation is reflecting aspects of who God is, his nature and attributes. Okay? So God created the universe. And the Bible tells us also that he created, you know, very specific. He created it in six days. We will get into that later on, right? Understanding creation. He created everything in six days and he rested on the seventh day. The third thing about creation is God created the heavens and the earth in its mature form. So, why is that important? Because some people, there are some people who try, uh, Christians, believers, who try to make science and the Bible fit together. They want to accept what science is saying. They want to accept what the Bible is saying. So, if science is saying it was an evolutionary process, that took millions and millions and millions of years. They want to fit that in into the Bible. So uh, they would say things like, well, God just set things in motion and then he let the evolutionary process bring everything into existence. So God was sitting and watching millions of years. <laughs> so they tried to mix the two. But that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says six days he created everything. Six days means six days. Don't change it. Then some people say no. Each day was one million years or some millions of years. No. A day is a day. And so these are things we have to talk about. right? How we respond to that. But there are some Christians uh, who try to mix the two. Oh, when the Bible says six days, it's not literally six days. Each day was some time period of millions of years. So you can imagine God was sitting, millions of years, okay, slowly it's happening. <laughs> what, what, you know, even to think of that is so illogical. Doesn't make sense. So we can't mix like that. No. Just stay with what the Bible says. Six days. So what does it mean? It means that. God, in the creative act of God, everything was created in a mature form. That means time, power, and intelligence was compressed in a moment. Example. Suppose God brought Adam and to you and said, tell me how old he is. You say, maybe 30 years. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, you see Adam. Maybe he's 30 years old or 25 years. God, no, no, no. He's only 20 seconds old. I just breathe life into him. Just breathe life. 
It's only 20 seconds. He just, he just came out of the ground. I just breathe like. But he looks like 20 years. It must have taken 20 years for him to come. <laughs> Whatever. In our understanding. I don't know what how old Adam looked when God created. But what I'm, the point is, God breathed. He became a living being. He didn't say God breathed and a baby was born. No. So in that instant, a mature man, whatever age he must have been, right, for our understanding, a mature man was formed and created, formed out of the dust in an instant. Now, when we look at that, if we were there and we looked at Adam at that moment, the moment he was created, in our minds we'll say, this must, he must be 25 years old. I don't, you know, some, some age we will give. I just breathed. So what happened? In the creative act of God, time, intelligence or design and power, it all came together in an instant. But according to our measurement, it will be some number of years. According to our measurement. Which is true. That will also be correct. No, no, no arguments. Yeah. Uh, if he's an example. If he say he's, he's about 30 years of age. Yes. From now onwards, everybody who's 30 years of age will look like that. But in creation, it took a... So, if somebody says... The earth is 4 billion years old. Okay, you count, you say whatever number you want. That keeps on changing, you know, according to our measurement. But in the creative act of God, it happened in an instant. Hmm? What, according to our measure, according to our calculations, we may say, so it must have taken so many millions of years to have taken place or for it to come like this. In the creation, time, power, and design came together in an instant. So God created everything in a mature form. So that is why today, when somebody says, oh, look, according to our, you know, whether you use carbon dating process or whatever measurement process, this must be so many millions of years old, or it must have been so many billions. We're not intimidated by it because we know. In a creative act of God, all this happens in an instant. So again, look at some other examples when you come in New Testament. Jesus turned water to wine. He turned water to wine. It was so good, the man, the whoever, the governor, the leader of the feast, he drank. So oh, this is nice. Uh, so in his mind, he must be thinking, ah, you must have kept it in the cellar 100 years or something, whatever time it was. Just, just one sec, one second. They filled it with water. We served it to you. That's all. But in an instant, in a miracle, the water, what was water, then became something that, in the natural, would have taken a long time to make. Right? Same thing. Multiplying bread and fish, in an instant. Nice cooked bread. <laughs> it's, com it's coming. Say, hey, it'll take two hours to make this. It's coming. It's just happening. Fresh bread. <laughs> it's kind of multiplying in an instant. So, in you know, so like this, you can look at many examples. The point is, in the creative act of God, time, power, and wisdom. All comes together in an instant. Okay? He created everything in a mature form. And the other thing we must also understand is that when God created things, He also set uh, natural processes, natural systems in place. That means from now onwards, this will keep on repeating. Okay. So, uh, 
uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we read, when he created the plants or the fruit, he said, you will bear fruit. The fruit will have the seed. So from then on, there was a process, a natural process God put in place. Seed will go to the ground. It will grow. It will become a plant, bear fruit. The fruit will have seed. And that seed will again go on the ground. It will keep on repeating. So God put that in place in creation. Okay. So for our minds, it's very clear. How he created and what he did when he created. He put natural systems in place. What we are doing, or in science, what we're doing is, we are studying these natural systems, these natural processes. Ah, see, it becomes, it goes into the ground. It germinates. It becomes like this. And then it produces. Okay. So you're taking that natural process and then you're trying to work backwards and come up with some theories that could have brought these natural processes in place. We're saying, oh, maybe this, for this process to come, we make it smaller and smaller and smaller and then come up with something. Oh, it started like this. One cell came, then one, you know, organism came. Then the organism became more complex and more complex. Then the monkey came. Then the ape, the ape came. Monkey came. Monkey came. From monkey came, became man. Man. Wait. Just because you're seeing natural systems, natural processes. These were put in place by God. But just because we're seeing that, we can't come up with some theories of other processes that we have no idea about, which we've never seen, and which can never be created, reproduced. So, all of that is only theory. Those, you know, we, we're assuming these kinds of processes could have happened. We give it lots of time. It took so many millions and billions of years. Never proved. It's not proved. But we are seeing processes today which God put in place that we can study whether plants or animals or you know in weather conditions yeah water evaporates goes becomes clouds comes down as rain other places will come down as snow yeah we are seeing these natural processes but God put them in place so uh, uh, these two very important things and then what the Bible teaches us is that God entrusted the earth to man. Psalm 115, verse 16. The heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to children of men. So it's okay. You, man, you be on earth, you take care of it. So God is helping us to understand things that we can see and so on. And number four, this is something important. That God gives evidence to his existence by his creation. So somebody says, you say there is a God. Why he's not showing himself? Why can't he say, hello, everybody. Every, every Monday morning, have an assembly. <laughs> All the people on the planet, let them hear your voice. Speak to every human person. All over the planet, every Monday. And everybody will know God is there. Why God is not revealing himself? If you're saying there is a God, why God is not showing himself? Well, the Bible has an answer for that. A very good answer. The answer is that God is revealing himself to us in his creation. He's revealing to us. So, uh, scripture here, Romans 1, 19-20. Um, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. That means God is revealing himself to us. How and where? Verse 20. From the creation of this world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. The invisible attributes of God are seen in creation. They're being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So verse 20 is very critical that the invisible attributes of God are made known to us in 
grace. So, if we are saying, God, why are you not revealing yourself to me? God is saying, hello. I'm everywhere you're going, I'm revealing myself to you in creation. This is everything we are seeing around us. It is evidence. It's, it's God's um, evidence to us that he is there. So let's look at creation. The attributes of God are seen in creation. But the problem is, verse 21 and 22, we are choosing not to see it. Yeah, we are, in so glorifying God, we are becoming fools. We are saying God didn't do this or something else did it. Right? Instead of recognizing uh, what we are seeing in creation as the attributes of God, we are looking, you know, we are, we are not glorifying God, we are doing other things. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day utter speech. That means, look, God is speaking. Every day he's speaking. How? Look at the heavens. Look at all this. He's speaking to us. And he's saying, there is no speech nor language where his voice is not heard. Where their voice is not heard. That means God is speaking to every person all the time in his creation. So it's not just Monday morning assembly. All the time, day and night. In his, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Look at who God is. And to all language, all, everyone. So it doesn't matter which part of the world you're in. You look at, look up, and you're seeing the glory of God. God is speaking, right? and uh, also, you know, in Psalm 139, just looking at Himself, the psalmist, I will praise you because I am fearfully, wonderfully made. God, He's just looking at Himself. How did I come like this? <laughs> just me, just looking at yourself. And God, just. How is this all working? The mind and body. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So we can look at creation. We look at the heavens. You look at yourself. God is speaking. I made you. And what does the Bible say? The fool, Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It is foolish to say, there is no God. So, uh, when we respond to the atheist, the atheist says, you know, I want evidence, right? So look, creation itself is God's evidence to you. Right? God is speaking to you, to what he created. Right? Then we can go into the philosophical questions, which we will see next. Uh, to the agnostic, we say the same thing. God is pointing out to you, Showing himself to you in his creation. So how you say you're saying you cannot know God, but just look. All of creation is God's evidence to you. So theologically, I mean from a Bible perspective, right? Chapter and verse perspective, this is what the Bible says about God. You know, one great uh, one one uh, uh, um, uh, uh, philosopher or an atheist, he, he made the statement. He said, if I see God, I'll ask him, why did you give so little evidence of your existence? But actually, we've seen God's evidence at all levels. Creation, cosmos, look at yourself. All of these are uh, evidence to God's existence. Okay? The theological. Now let's move to the philosophical, which is just thinking about life and thinking about things in general. First one is what we will say cause and effect. Right? That means every effect must have a cause. Every effect must have a cause. Example, we are sitting here. Suppose one ball comes flying inside. What will we all look for? From where came? And suppose I said, no, no, the ball just came. It's, no, no. 
somebody must have thrown it somebody must have hit it so you look outside say maybe a, so the effect a ball flying across has to have a cause you cannot have an effect which is in this case example a ball flying inside this room without a cause if i am trying to convince you the ball just came by itself it took millions of millions of years and the ball was formed in the air at that time millions of years and then it just went so something is wrong with this pastor <laughs> today he has lost his mind <laughs> because logically you know somebody has to thrown it or hit the ball or something right so that is the first thing just some uh, you know it's just simple logic simple logic and every person will agree to this every effect has to have a cause something that caused it it can't just happen by itself so what we are saying is the effect we are seeing creation has to have had a creator we can't say it just came by itself it just happened it just came from nothing no no there had to be a creator who could have so much of wisdom so much of power uh, to bring everything into existence and to keep everything in place okay so the effect that we are seeing which is all of creation has to have had a creator the second is that just as creation attests to a creator a design calls for a design right suppose <coughs> so i say this mobile phone it's a simple device but if i say this mobile phone evolved by itself it took 4 billion years and this mobile phone just came somewhere the plastic just came the hardware pieces just came they all just fell together and then the software came from somewhere <laughs> and it went inside the <laughs> hardware and it's functioning very nicely now battery also came everything came and it just happened but it took it took a long time some millions of years and this came no one of us would believe that no 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 this was made in a factory somewhere somebody manufactured it somebody wrote the software people wrote it. and they, put, they somebody put it together because there is design in it and uh, there's it's very intelligent it's very you know it's there's a lot of design a lot of thought somebody or a people group of people who could do all this they put their minds together and they made it that's how we know it okay now the universe is much more complex than this mobile phone much more complex eh, so many you take a leaf you take all these birds animals people systems in the environment so many things everything has design intelligence so if you can't believe that this self mobile phone came by itself how you have the faith to believe this universe came by itself that's great faith <laughs> to have faith that it all just happened by itself the intelligence and everything just happened just happened now there had to be a designer somebody who was so wise who was so intelligent who could think through all these things and who gave that intelligence and brought it into existence right so uh design calls for a design 
simple. Okay? One is cause and effect. Every effect has to have a cause. Every design has to have a design. Otherwise, you cannot. Somebody has to be bigger than the design to put it together. And so these are philosophical statements, simple statements, which we can talk to people and say, hey, you think with me, we think together. A third thing is this. Morality and rationality. Morality and rationality. So, example. Suppose I take a big stone. Keep it here. Keep it for millions of years. Do you think after millions of years, the stone can develop two things? Can it develop by itself? Morality and rationality. That means the ability to think and reason and the ability to know right and wrong. You think the stone can develop that by itself? No. So say, see, we are all dust, we are all mud only. Our bodies, what is a mud only? I put it on the ground, it will decay. So basically, we are saying we are like the stone, mud. But this piece of mud has rationality, ability to think. And this piece of mud has morality, has a sense of right hand. So, so you're saying the stone by itself cannot acquire rationality, ability to think. And the stone by itself cannot develop sense of right hand. Wrong. Then how you got it? If you're saying you came from carbon molecules from somewhere, over time it evolved. Now you're here. You're from the mud only. How come you and I have rationality and morality? The only way we can say is it was given to us by God. It was given to us. So we are dust. This body is dust. But this body has something that's very you 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 can't just acquire it from some by itself. This, the stone will not just get the ability to think and uh, uh, sense of morality. It cannot happen. God gave it. God gave it. It came from somebody who has that. So when God breathed into Adam, he was transferring some attributes of himself to a piece of mud. Now he formed Adam from the dust of the earth and he breathed. His intelligence, all the power and also the aspect of rationality and morality was transferred, was put into this piece of dust. So not only did the physical body come into existence, but to that body was given these abilities. It cannot, we cannot acquire this by ourselves. This table is wood. It only remains wood. It will never be able to acquire rationality and morality. Never. Maybe you can do what you want with it. Pour any kind of chemicals on it. Do what you want. It will never acquire that. It has to be given from somewhere. So, ability to think and ability to know right and wrong, morality, is something given to us and therefore that points to God. Somebody who has it can only give it. Yeah? So, number four, supernatural phenomena. Right? So now we, again, it's kind of philosophical, but we're also pointing to the supernatural. So you say, hey, have you seen people who are demon-possessed? Yeah. Why do they behave like that? That is outside the realm of psychology. 
even psychologists cannot explain demon possession. Why is that person like that? In that moment, manifest. Then why in the name of Jesus that person is set free? And then they come to their normal right mind. They're free now. Unexplained. So there's one example of supernatural phenomena or when people experience healing or so on. How is that possible? Right? So we can point to different supernatural phenomena and say, these are things you cannot explain. But it's happening. So it's, and I'm using the case of deliverance because that is something you see right in front of your eyes. A person who's demon-possessed, who's manifesting, and then they are delivered. They're fine. In the mighty name of Jesus. How do you explain that? Cannot. So, again, this is now questions we can ask. Right? So, therefore, we ask a very simple question. Can man live without God? Because wherever you take God out of the equation and you say, you do what you want, that has always resulted in a society that self-destructs. That means people destroy themselves. They, everybody uh, eventually want to make up their own rules. They will destroy themselves. Right? Life becomes, there is no moral law. Life becomes meaningless. Life becomes hopeless. And they self-destruct. So ultimately, that question. You, know, you have to think through. If you live, can man live without Okay, so let's pause here. I know it didn't give you time for questions, but I want you to think about this lesson. Go back, just review it, and uh, next week, uh, ask questions. Right? You know, we'll take up some questions on this. Then we will move forward uh, next chapter where we, where we talk about faith and science. Um, Pastor, just one quick yes, question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I've always had this question uh, for a very long time. See, right now we are in... 2024 AD. Yes. Okay. And when we say the universe is like around millions of years, uh, light years, whatever. And then you have a scripture portion in uh, 2 Peter 3 8, which says, For God, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. Yeah. So, how does one actually correlate? Uh, right. So, when the Bible tells us um, that you know, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Basically, that Peter states that. Basically, he's saying time doesn't matter to God. Yeah, God is, that's the basic what he's saying. So we shouldn't take that as one day equals thousand years or thousand years equals... No, no. Basically, it's, he, it's just a statement, a figure of speech saying God is, time doesn't matter to God. Okay, that's all. So we leave it at that. And when we, we will try to, we will come to this chapter on creation where we are looking at what the Bible says and what science says. How do we answer? How do you respond to that? We will, we will address that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry I didn't give enough time for questions today. We will pause here today. Next week, uh, you know, if you have any questions, we'll start with that. And then we will um, get into our next lesson. Thank you. Think about these things and uh, come back with questions. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.